St. Petersburg has, throughout its history, been the cultural heart of Russia. And it was in this city that Mikhail Ivanovich Glinka's masterpiece, Ruslan and Ludmilla, was first performed in 1842, here at the Marinsky Theatre. And this is the first recorded performance of Ruslan and Ludmilla ever to be seen outside Russia. The artistic director of the Marinsky Theatre and conductor of tonight's performance, Valery Gergiev, is interviewed now by Dr. Rainer Moritz. This will be the first complete production of Ruslan and Ludmilla to be seen in the West on television. How come, uh, Valery, that most people only know the overture to this wonderful masterpiece? I always ask myself how it was possible that for so many years, maybe the Iron Curtain helped, that it was kept as a really strong secret. You think the secret export weapon of Russia? Now it becomes, because you don't uh, import a lot of things from Russia, maybe some... Oh, we import you all the time. <laughs> yeah. Listen. Uh, what, makes me, what makes me happy is that it happens now uh, instead of never. Do you think it's difficult to cast? And is this one of the reasons maybe why Western opera houses have shied away from doing it? Yes, it is difficult to cast. You can't find easily a singer who is, you know, let's say, easily dealing with Tessitura, Ruslan, for example, because it's very high and very low. Yeah. It should be very noble but very strong bass. Already these qualities require somebody very, very good. In fact, we have many basses here, and it is even here not easy to find uh, a one singer who is ideal, sort of, that has everything. For Ludmila, you have, again, it should be brilliant coloratura, but she, sh she should be young. So it, and very good looking, otherwise good looking, the story otherwise makes the no story sense. story absolutely doesn't make sense. In fact, our Ludmila is a good looking girl. And uh, she's very, very young, 23. Fantastic. So it's a very risky, very risky decision, which I was, of course, making myself because you know, I thought that we have to work with her. But instead of having 40 years old, experienced, and maybe complete professional on stage for video, for audiences, I vote for a fresh young, voice. fresh, yeah. honest, naive, maybe not fully, fully equipped, let's say, for long role and for all this. But you know, sometimes singers, even good singers, with all their habits, after 10, 15 yeah, years of stage, mannerism, mannerism yes, it yes. becomes less interesting. Yep. So I really think that we have a good, uh, altogether good combination of experience and youth, freshness and already some uh, really s strong repertoire so the people who go through you know not only Glinka or, or Wagner or Mozart but they go through many 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 other things modern repertoire and they bring with them to uh, in a way but naive repertoire like Glinka all of this experience now I have to say it's very difficult to cast even smaller roles for example Bayan Bayan is extremely very difficult. difficult. You need a extremely, very good tenor. Yeah, extremely difficult because you need somebody with a big voice, but lyrical color in it, but, but speaks to the big crowd of people on stage. You can't expect somebody very, very tiny, completely lyrical, and it should be also somebody with imagination. And so it, it's some sort of charisma because, I mean, he, after all, uh, predicted, predicted the story. Yes, correct, predicts the story. We have also to remember that it's a fairy tale. We also have to remember it's based on Pushkin. Pushkin for us in Russia means really as much as Shakespeare means for not only Great Britain, maybe for the whole world, because we read it in Russian and the melody, the, the sound of Pushkin poetry is, is to be compared with Mozart or Shakespeare. Now that brings us to the question of course of the times and why did Glinka and his generation all of a sudden turn to Russian poets, to Russian uh, plots? I think again they were so strongly influenced by Pushkin. They were wonderful poets like Lermontov or, or even earlier than Pushkin, Dyrzhavin. They were very very good poets but Pushkin was very Russian, and he was at the same time very cosmopolitan. When you look at this Chernomor, you can imagine something like even Iranian 
lands or, or, or Indian lands. Yes. By the way, it's a very interesting part of, of the story and musical value of Ruslan is so high that we can see a lot of connections, influences from Glinka to Borodin and especially his eastern pages. Very oriental uh, harmonies and melodies. And unbelievably beautiful yeah. Can you writing. give us a few examples of the folklore uh, Glinka used? He was himself uh, famous with his remark that it's not us composers, it's the people who create the music. music. We just made yeah. arrangements. Does one example come to your mind? The eastern pages of Ruslan are extremely famous in my country. That means their melodic value, their immediate char mm -hmm. character makes it so memorable that you once you hear this, the March of Chernobyl. Yep. Oh, rum, pom, hey, rum, pom, pom, played by brass. Yep. Or the banda. So you've got a real banda on top. Yes, we have a full big yep. banda here. And I have to say, once you hear it, you never forget it, at least in my country. But the banda idea comes from Italy, basically. Yes. In fact, Glinka knew very, very well Italian. Yeah, he, he had been for a couple of years, yes. but that was earlier than Verdi composed his first opera. Yes. So I think there's no Verdian influence. We have to look at Donizetti, we have to look mm -hmm. at Bellini, very, very, I would say very strongly, if we want to speak about Glinka and, and influence. And Rossini Italian. too, maybe. Of course. Rossini was famous in Russia. I mean, you've got the Farlaf, that famous piece, which You is know, even, oh yeah, Farlaf yeah. is in fact this buffo, bas buffo. Yeah. But what is interesting about Farlaf? You can't just rely on somebody who is good with Rossini, with, with all this quick, you know, let's say, with stretto, and when yeah. you have this ability of singer to, to sing in bas buffo, it should be still quite heavy. It, the Russian opera, in principle, the sound, maybe it's something to do with Russian language, it requires quite heavy sound, so well supported. It's the volume. And this dramatic yep. strength of the color yep. and, and again volume. And in Russian opera, and I have to say in Ruslan as well, we also face this problem. We face this problem because Gorislava, Ruslan, Ratmir, Ratmir is contralto, yes. extremely low. Fantastic part. Yeah, yeah, of unbelievable, yeah effective. Public yeah. loves it. Yep. And the, uh, the area with the dances is so long, you practically never see. Since this uh, operas and at the beginning of 19th century, you never see somebody maybe in Wagner operas, but it's not really arias what they're doing there. No. And here you have just wretched in an aria. It's and a it lasts, stretching for more than seven minutes. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. endless. And with the dances, it, it's, it's so long. Still, music is so well balanced that it's never boring. That's it's true. never boring. And I think Glinka was very uh, strong. He was very, very gifted, I would say, fantastically gifted in this, uh, with this ability to hear from Italy, Spain. Weber, uh, also German, of yeah. course, influence, but to remain very Russian and to be what we call him father of Russian music, because look at Tchaikovsky, look at even Stravinsky. By the way, you will, you will read a lot about Glinka if you look at Stravinsky's Absolutely, memoir. Absolutely, yes. He will always come back to Glinka. Yes. He will dedicate That's to true. Tchaikovsky and Glinka. Yeah. He, he will always think of Glinka as a brilliant master of not only composition, orchestration, color, timbre. And this is important. The, the writing for the voices, yes, we also have problems now with some operas of Mozart and Rossini to cast them in the end of the 20th century. Glinka is, in fact, joining this, this brilliant company because you have a problem to cast his operas easily. So we are, easy. we are lucky we've got the cast we've got here, which I think is almost ideal. And I do think we have with this full version, since you are kindly opening that one cut you made, uh, first scene, fifth act, uh, we're actually having the first complete recording of the work. It, it should be the first one. And uh, what, what is also hopefully coming with this recording that uh, many theatres, many I mean, intendants and artistic directors will look at it and maybe yet at it and try to opera, stage it themselves. The opera will yeah. start its, finally, start its international life, if I may say yeah, so. More than 150 years after its world premiere yeah. in Petersburg and in 1842. Strangely enough, always it was recognized as a com 
complete success musically, masterpiece. Every great man, not only Tchaikovsky, not only Mussorgsky or Rimsky, but everyone who was writing about Russian opera or opera at all in this country would say Glinka is the father of all of us. Glinka started it. We all come from his ideas. We, we all are still supported. He, he just gave us so much that we can, we can, we can do so much. Shostakovich, Prokofiev, everybody paid a lot of respect Tribute to, uh, Linka, to yes. Glinka. Let's talk a little bit about uh, this very production. You are using designs for sets and costumes from a 1910 production, is that correct? Yes, yes. It's, it's something like that. I think the decision to make a production, which in fact was a new production in terms of everything is done now. We yes. don't use any old you know, items of the production. But you looked at Golovin and yes. Korovin designs. Miraculously, miraculously, we kept the production itself alive until 88 when I became music director. It was one of the first things I had here and you had in your mind possibilities yeah. I thought Korovin, Golovin, Glinka, Ruslan, Ludmila, everything looks very very good why don't I try to bring it back because I remember several times I saw it in end of 70s I still saw the old production which was the exact I mean this is the exact copy of what we uh, owned for so many years and miraculously they kept it alive so they didn't destroy it it was well made, of course, and the Russian. In fact, people knew how to do things here. The workshops were very good. Very yeah. good. And the ability still here, the ability of painting, to paint the, the decoration and uh, to work with the color is very, very good here. This is what I think is the strongest part of our stagecraft, there was a technical uh, strength, because in the West there are many productions where lighting and uh, structured sort of on stage, building the unit sets yeah. and all these things. You went very far in the West, I think. Sometimes I think even too far. Well, more towards music theater than just uh, uh, operatic storytelling. We kept in Russia something, what comes from the tradition, end of last century. We, for example, still own you know, sketches or some complete productions of Roller, who was working even with Verdi, in, yep. in 1863, first La Forza. La Forza here. It's amazing, yeah. but uh, even some people come to me now and say, why don't you recreate this roller uh, La Forza production? Because we have in a very good shape the sketches. So what did the press say uh, to this new production of yours? The, the press here was not completely amazed with the Gorovin Korovin because they saw it for last 30 or 40, it depends how old the critic is. Mm. If he's 70 years old, he saw it 50 times. If he is 45 years old, he maybe saw it 10 times. If he's, uh, let's say, 30 years old, still he saw it maybe six years ago when he was a student. So it was not a great news for the critics in my country. But we don't work for critics, first of all. Second, we don't work only for Russian audiences. We also do not work only for Western audiences. The combination the complexity of, of this, the, the chance which Kirov Opera has now to keep it opened for Russian, British, German, American, Japanese audiences and thanks to television and video, we, we are also very flexible. We are not, I can tell you why, we are not completely stuck with the planning in 1999. Do you have the original score of Linka? I don't have it in my hands, but... Uh, it is here in St. Petersburg. In St. Petersburg. Has it been changed at all? Because, I mean, most of the Russian composers have this terrible fate of being rewritten by their peers yes, at some with, stage. With Glinka, it's a different story. Glinka was a master orchestration, first of all. Compared to Mussorgsky, he didn't suffer at all. In fact, it was his achievement. He just completed most of what he composed and most of his musical ideas, they were finished. He didn't suffer. As far as I know, he was... Uh, what we hear now is Glinka, and then there is no serious doubt that somebody's hand, uncarefully or painfully, you know, was operating on this material. Because with Mussorgsky, and this is a very, very sensitive subject, we speak about it a lot in the world, in the musical world. Mm. Let's talk about the singers. How come that you uh, surprise us uh, 
all the time with new talent. Yes. Where did you find Anna all of a sudden, 23 year old? Yes, we... Or Ludmilla? I am in a way forced to spend more time than, let's say, Ricardo Murti, a conductor who I respect, or let's say, Jimmy Levine, who I respect. I am maybe forced to spend even more time in auditioning different people and looking at them and saying, all right, it's not yet good, but it's, it's something there so interesting that it can work finally, it can make it all together very interesting material. So, and we risk, we give them a chance, sometimes it doesn't work. So we even risk during uh, such important projects like now because Anna Netrebko is in a way a risk, but the feeling is that potential is good, uh, many good qualities, fresh, interesting, good looking, natural, this is important, organic, natural, not artificial behavior, natural. This is finally what is important, especially for a video where people can enjoy it. And especially if you put it in a, such a surrounding, I mean, Korovin Golovin, if you have a production from somebody very intellectual, dark, a lot of light effects, very, let's say, dramatic, precise, precise stage precise. directions, yes. You maybe do not need beautiful people on stage, maybe you have characteristic faces, mm. maybe it gives a bit more uh, to the whole uh, sort of strength of the production. Here, you need people who look good. And you've got them? Yes, I think, because Gorchakova is also young, and she also has this, you know, freshness and energy. And in fact, uh, Gorislava should be sung by dramatic soprano, and uh, Ludmila is lyrical soprano, and Gorislava should be a woman. Mature. Uh, yeah, mature, woman. and woman with a different sort of passion, where yes. you have a girl, Ludmila, and she's a bride, and she expects a lot from her future, and she's for the first time uh, l looking at men, and they all want her hand. So it's, it's quite, quite authentic, the situation which, which we have here, even the age of each singer. So we've got an authentic production with authentic singers. Hopefully. Thank you very much. <laughs>